All four Gospels record his baptism, but none addresses these two questions. We do know from Luke's account of Jesus' visit to the temple at 12 years of age that he had a clear understanding, even then, of his special relationship with God. As he replied to his poor mother, distraught after spending three days searching for him, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Luke chapter 2 then ends with the comment, that he returned to Nazareth, was obedient to them, and grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. But we hear nothing more of Jesus until he presents himself to John the Baptism, John the Baptist for baptism in the River Jordan. And within that event, the Holy Trinity is publicly revealed. We read in Luke 3:22. As Jesus was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. John's Gospel records in chapter 1, verses 32 to 34, that John the Baptist witnessed the Spirit come down in the form of a dove and that he had been forewarned that this would be the sign that God's chosen one had arrived. At this point, Jesus must have been on a spiritual high, experiencing elation that his father had publicly acknowledged him, and that the starting pistol for his earthly ministry had been fired. But did he know, even at this moment, what was immediately in store for him? Or was that a secret known only to the Father and the Holy Spirit? All three Gospels that record the temptation in the wilderness say that Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. And Mark and Luke both give a clear impression that he was being tested by Satan throughout that period. Here, perhaps, we might ask, why was it necessary for Jesus to be tempted? Surely he was the Son of God and could be trusted to resist. Well, firstly, it's a demonstration to all the world what it meant for him to be fully human and also divine. Secondly, having come to restore sinners to a right relationship with God the Father, he needs to experience for himself what it means to struggle with temptation. And he needs to show us that caving into it is not inevitable. He will reveal the solution in his own responses. And even now, you and I can call on him for support. As the writer of the letter to the Hebrews puts it in chapter 2, verse 18, because Jesus himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Matthew and Luke both record the three major temptations and that they came at the end of 40 days and nights without any food and that Jesus was hungry at that point. Hungry is a bit understated perhaps. Were the gospel writers afraid of upsetting their more squeamish writers, readers? Or perhaps it was the translators. After that time in extremely inhospitable conditions, with no food and possibly no water, most people would either be ravenous or resigned to dying at any moment. In fact, might it have needed a miracle for Jesus to be alive at this point? My mind was taken back here to the predicament of Hagar and Ishmael when they were sent away from the family by Abraham in Genesis chapter 21. And God, having already promised in chapter 17 verse 20 to make Ishmael into the father of a great nation, 
had to intervene to save them after very few days in the desert of Beersheba. The three Gospels all suggest the, sent, the venture into the desert followed immediately on from the baptism. God wanted Jesus to be tested straight away as a second foundation for his ministry. And so there was no time to pack a toothbrush or more usefully a pillow and blanket. It's quite probable that the days were extremely hot and the nights were bitterly cold. Unless the wild animals mentioned in Luke 1 verse 13 were kind enough to share their caves with Jesus. Matthew, supported by Luke, records that when Jesus was hungry after those 40 days, Satan took his opportunity and hit Jesus with the first big temptation. If, or more correctly, as you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. With all the miracles that Jesus subsequently performed, many involving food and drink, there's no doubt that he could have done what Satan suggested. However, Jesus silences Satan with words from Deuteronomy 8, chapter 3. It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan knew Jesus had the power. Jesus knew he had the power. But Jesus also knew it was vital that he faced this temptation with only the same resources as those available to human beings for whom he had come. To use his divine power to satisfy his own personal need would have been sin and would have failed to reveal to us the power of God's word. Satan then took Jesus to the holy city and placed him on the highest point of the temple. As you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus does not enter into any debate with Satan, but simply rebuffs him with words from Deuteronomy 6.16. It is also written, do not put your God to the test. We can learn several things from this temptation. Firstly, Satan knows the scriptures and may quote them to us. Secondly, he is prone to do so out of context. And in this case, he's quoting from Psalm 91 verses 11 to 12, but ignoring what goes before. If we read verses 9 to 12 together, we will see that the psalmist is effectively saying that if we live our lives in a relationship of dependence on God, he and his angels will be our protection. I will read the four verses together and invite you to consider whether the protection being offered extends to skydiving without a parachute. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus was being encouraged to use his divine power to usher in his ministry with a brief spectacle that even if a crowd had witnessed him being rescued by a legion of angels, would that have made later crowds take his teaching more to heart? Probably not, as he would have cast doubts on his true humanity and lost his right to speak man to man. When we are serving God, we need to avoid gimmicks and ensure that we have a good knowledge of the Bible so that we can correctly handle the word of truth, as Paul writes in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. Finally, the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain 
and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. What is going on here? Jesus had come to win the kingdoms of this world back from Satan, who now offers him a shortcut, bypassing all the pain and degradation of the cross. Satan is happy to give up these king, those kingdoms so long as he can receive worship and recognition from God. He'd been seeking this since he fell from grace and he made a dramatic statement of intent in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. God allows Satan to act as the God of this age, as mentioned in Corinthians, and that must have implied authority from God the Father to hand all the kingdoms over to Jesus if he so wished. It would be impossible to see all those kingdoms from one vantage point, so perhaps it, Satan has shown them all to Jesus in a vision, or perhaps they're looking out from a very high peak in the Holy Land and the splendor is that of a broad panorama. Either way, Jesus orders Satan to go away and quotes from Deuteronomy 6.13. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This third temptation is about achieving personal power and prestige by worshiping other gods. This would have been anathema to Jesus, but it seems to be commonplace among many today who exert great influence on the world stage, where their assets or their prestige have themselves become their gods. But rather than finger pointing, we all need to be on our guard against creating false gods in our lives. Another key point to learn from Jesus' handling of this temptation is that we can all tell Satan to get lost. James is very clear on this in chapter 4, verse 7, where he says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Peter, in his first letter to the churches in present-day Turkey, gives very similar advice, which we should take on board. Reading from chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I just want to stop at this point and thank Steve for that uh, little video he showed, because it really fits in at this point very true that idea that we grow by receiving the buffeting of storms and that they help us to put firm roots down and we are in a time when those roots are needed because what I've just been saying links in to something Tim said last week towards the end of his talk about the transfiguration he warned that changing attitudes in society towards Christians may well bring persecution our way within a matter of years. In a very real sense, temptation and persecution go hand in hand. As Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 24 about times that sound horribly like the present, he uttered those chilling words, at that time, 
many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Linked with his words in chapter 10 about betrayal within families, we need to see how temptation can lead to betrayal and betrayal to persecution and death. The best way for us to live is to follow the advice of Peter and James, to humble ourselves and submit to God so that we can resist the devil and play our part in protecting the family of believers. The temptations were a very private affair. No journalists or cameramen present. So how do we know about them? Jesus would have recognized that they were important and needed to be known to his followers to warn them in turn as to how to resist temptation. We too need guidelines. What a member of my small group calls coat hangers. So let me finish with three suggested coat hangers to think about this coming week. Firstly, we should watch out, particularly when life gets difficult. Secondly, no debating. Just reject the devil with a well-chosen scripture. And finally, beware of accepting any shortcuts. There may be a slide appearing on the screen. Aha! Three coat hangers. Watch out, especially when life is difficult. No debating. Just reject with a well-chosen scripture. And beware of accepting any shortcuts. Shortcuts can be good, but as Jesus experienced in his third temptation, they can also be fatal. So, May God make us more alert to temptation and more confident to deal with it in his ways so that our lives give more glory to him. Amen.